been asked today to talk about the impact of the practice of healthcare on the environment and in turn our own personal health. And I also want to share some of the attempts we are making at UCSF and the Department of Anesthesia and the Medical Center to make it mitigate some of the effects of climate change. And I want to leave everyone with opportunities to take away from this 30 minutes something that you can change, actionable items that you can take home. Now, I consider myself a very positive person. And, you know, having gone through two, two cancers and moved different countries, but I want to say that this is grim. This is really, really grim. And I want everyone to take the next 30 minutes seriously and take it like a call for action. So in 2009, a hard hit report was produced by the Lancet Commission on Health and Climate Change. And this report was produced by about 27 institutions comprising of doctors, academics, policymakers, and it really hit hard because it linked climate change to all the heat waves, healthcare disparities, uh, fires, storms, so on and so forth that has inundated our news these days. And very promptly in 2015, the central theme of the second Lancet Commission report changed the tone and actually said tackling climate change would be the greatest global health opportunity for the 21st century. And this is the first time that climate change changed to a healthcare issue. It changed from a policy and environmental and economic issue to more of a healthcare issue. And despite this happening in 2015, not everyone nationally and globally saw the relationship between climate change and individual health. We're very fortunate at the UCSF and in the bubble of California that our visionary leadership by President Janet Napolitano set a very ambitious goal of carbon neutrality from 10 campuses within 10 years. So as a doctor, I, I take my responsibility very seriously. And this veracity index is out of 2020. And it really shows that healthcare workers are looked upon as someone that have opinions that still matter. And I think I take this responsibility very seriously and especially in this times of existential confusion, polarized views in a divided country. I do think that being in a profession that has a standing in a society comes with a lot of responsibility. So how are we doing as U.S. healthcare? And it should be no surprise to anyone in this call that we are the most expensive healthcare in the world. Compared to our peers, which are the high economic nations, we spend twice as much on healthcare as the rest of our countries. At about 18% of our GDP is spent on healthcare. And that amounts to about $10,000 per person. And why is that the case? And that's the case because we do more. We do more studies, we do more testing. We have more imaging. And just to give you an example here, if you look at United States, we do about 100 MRIs per thousand population, which puts us way above all the other developed countries. The same thing for CT scan and PET scans. So we're the most expensive, we do the most testing, and the assumption is we must be the best. But sadly, when I checked this morning in 2020, we've dropped to 37th in the world in the quality of healthcare that we provide. We lag behind our peers in infant mortality, in obesity, smoking, chronic diseases, life expectancy. So it's safe to say that we're the most expensive. We do the most testing, but we still don't have the best outcomes. Now shifting gears, let's see how we do in terms of our carbon emissions. And this graph here um, was produced by uh, someone at Yale, Dr. Jody Sherman, who is tirelessly working to champion the environmental impacts of anesthesia, greenhouse gases on the environment. 
And this study was done over 10 years, 2003 to 2013. And it looked at the carbon emissions from US healthcare. Now we all know that US is the second largest carbon emitter in the world. But how is US healthcare doing? In 2013, 10% of all the carbon emissions from the US originated from healthcare. And this is very significant because if you picked up US healthcare and put it on an island as a separate country, we would be the 13th largest emitter of greenhouse gases in the world. And how does this impact our own health, right? Um, one of the silver linings that has come out of COVID is in addition to the lockdown, which has really decreased our carbon emissions for about 7%, is I've also had this opportunity to binge on Netflix. And one of my favorite shows has been The Crown. And I've enjoyed watching Vincent Churchill and some of his quotes. And when I saw this, that it says, we shape our dwellings and then our dwellings shape us. At UCSF, we're acquiring buildings and building new hospitals. And we know that hospitals are the second largest energy intensive structures only after restaurants. It's because we're, they're large buildings that open 24 seven. We're using air conditioning, sophisticated HVACs, laboratories are open, sterilization facilities are open. And this makes hospitals a very resource intense environment. So coming back to Dr. Sherman's um, study, it did show that hospitals account for a lot of acidification in addition to about 10% of greenhouse gas emissions. They also account for acidification of the rains. They account for ozone depletion and smog formation. So this is same sort of explained in a different way and it says about 12% of ozone depletion, about 10 to 12% of respiratory illnesses caused by particulate matter and um, ground level increase in ozone all comes from healthcare. So the very sort of tenant of healthcare is do no harm. And with this, we've clearly proved that the very healthcare we're delivering to our patients is actually adversely impacting their health as well. This is another study which sort of talks about just the greenhouse gases emitted from healthcare and it attributes them to the rising sea levels, air pollution, natural disasters and increased temperatures. We know that this translates in, to include increased vector transmission, respiratory illness, cardiovascular illness. And I know this, this has been extensively discussed in the prior lecture, so I'm not gonna talk about it right now. But it's safe to say that the healthcare we provide negatively impacts the health of the patients we're supposed to take care of. Bringing this a little closer to home, um, as an anesthesiologist, I wanted to talk about the operating rooms. Uh, the operating rooms are the most resource intensive area in the hospital. It's because we have a lot of lights, a lot of electricity, and a lot of air conditioning requirements. But in addition, we generate a lot of waste. About 20 to 33% of all the waste produced in the hospital originates from the operating rooms. And I wanted to talk about some of the things that we've done to mitigate this. And as I have these discussions, it's very important to keep in mind that the patient safety and patient quality and the care that we produce has to be at the pinnacle. That has to be the center of everything we do. But to accept the economic and the ecological impact of that care, just as collateral damage should not be acceptable to healthcare providers anymore. So I wanted to sort of give some examples of what we've done and, and I didn't go to med school thinking I'm going to dumpster dive. But that's what's happened in the last couple of years. I've spent a lot of time going through the downstream and really looking at the trash and saying, how do things land in the trash? So I presented about 17 cases here, but we audited about 86 cases through a grant of the city of San Francisco to see what is the waste that we generate. And you see there's plastics, liquids, blue towels, which is cloth, there's rigid plastics, foam, which we know are detrimental to sea life and the ocean, and a lot of textile. 
And in each of these areas now, we have set targets and goals to actually reduce some of our consumption. And a few examples that I want to share will be about textiles, where we're trying to look at reusable textiles. Um, a, big, a big thing to talk about right now is really the surge in single-use devices. And I think it started somewhere around the time of CJD, the Crexpole Jekpole disease or mad cow disease, where we thought that a lot of our items will actually transmit CJD, whether it's our intubating laryngoscopes or the equipments that the ENT surgeons use. And there has been no demonstrated case report of actually transmission of CJD from anesthesia equipment or ENT equipment. But despite that, the single use devices have stayed. And, and often we have to question the industry that doesn't come up with more sustainable options. And this is where we all come in and which is what I'll talk about later. So talking about, this was a landmark study produced in the Lancet and it looked at three different countries, operating rooms across three different countries. It looked at Canada, US, and the UK. And it was really a landmark study because it compared the carbon footprint of operating rooms across three continents. And I want you to focus on this big blue bar here, which is anesthesia gases. So the role of anesthesia in the entire carbon footprint of the operating rooms is very significant. But what to note is also that the role is significant in A and B, which is Canada and America, and sort of about 5% in the UK. And the reason for that was one and only one gas, which was desflurane. And we'll talk more about that in a second. So anesthesia gases are potent greenhouse gases. And there are three most common anesthesia gases that we use, isoflurane, sevoflurane, and desflurane. And as I alluded in my previous slide, the desflurane has a very, very different potential compared to sevoflurane uh, and isoflurane in causing greenhouse gas emissions. And it lingers in the environment for hundreds of years and is very significant in its global warming potential as alluded in this slide. But also how we use the gas is very important, right? So if you use the gas in low flows, I won't get into a lot of technicalities, but if you use the gas in low flows versus high flows is very relevant. Now I trained in the UK and when I moved here to the US, I was really surprised to see how high flows we use the anesthesia gases at. And I asked the residents and I asked my colleagues and I said, why are you using gases at ranges of one to two liters when we, you can use it at 0.5 liters per minute? And the answer was, because this is how we've always done it. And, um, so with that, we created a homegrown tool, which really prompts every single anesthesia provider to say, you're using this gas and do you need to use it at this amount? Or can you use it at a lower amount? Uh, we subsequently published some of this and this was a very revolutionary idea when we started working on it. And lo and behold, we've seen some huge success. But our baseline gas requirements in sevoflurane and desflurane were between 1.5 and two liters. And in SIBO, we've pretty much reduced our greenhouse gas emissions to about half. And similarly, for desflurane, we've significantly changed the amount of desflurane used. But even after this slide was created, I want to say that out of four of the health systems or the four of the hospitals that we have in the UC health system, three of them have completely eliminated desflurane. And in only one hospital, we have it for historic significance. So this was a huge victory in decreasing the greenhouse gases from anesthesia. Often when people talk about sustainability in healthcare, and I, and I think that it's all well-meaning, but I see that there is a lot of focus on recycling. Recycling, how do we recycle instead of more recycling bins? And I think that that is essential. But I would really like to present a new paradigm in sustainability is where we rethink. We rethink every single choice that we're making. We rethink about every single equipment that we're using. And here are some of the examples that I wanna talk about. And one is the anesthesia circuit. Every time you get anesthesia, you need to go to sleep. There's a circuit that delivers the gases to the patient. Now to note, 
In US, we use the circuit at UCSF one patient per circuit. And in UK where I trained and in Australia and in Germany and in New Zealand, these circuits are changed either once a day or once a week. So this is where we need to work with policymakers and educators and bring us to scratch with our peers and other practices globally. What we can also do is refuse single use devices. As I said, single use devices do not have an added safety potential, do not have an added safety profile that has been clinically proven. And they add to our landfill waste and have a huge carbon footprint. We have to look at reducing. And by that, I mean is auditing every single thing we need. You know, do I need to use this machine? Do I not need to use this machine? But this constant thought process of I rethink everything I do. You know, if you go to a restaurant and you take two towels, do I need two paper towels or can I do with one? Do I need two sachets of ketchup or can I just do with one? And, and I have to say, just sort of digressing for one second is when my mother-in-law was visiting us from the UK. Um, in UK, McDonald's, you have to go and ask for ketchup and then you get one sachet. And here you can just go and grab a handful and then throw a rest out. So I think just rethinking our approach to how we use things and how we waste things is very important. Another thing is reprocessing, which I'm gonna talk about. And then once we've sort of gone through all these steps, we end up with whatever's left work on recycling. So reprocessing is really a process by which the single use devices are bought back by vendors. They're clean, they're sterilized, and they're repackaged for us to buy back. There's a huge economic advantage in reprocessing, but also, it's not well advertised by the equipment manufacturers because it's not in their best interest. And that's why as healthcare workers, getting more involved in policy and more involved in decision-making at a supply chain and purchase level is very important. So at UCSF, we created the reprocessing of a device called Hovermat, which is used to transport patients from one bed to the another. And I wanna show you some of the results of reprocessing. So on the left here, is when reprocessing doesn't go into landfill, right? Instead of just being disposed of into landfill, we actually had vendors buy it and we saved a lot by not paying for a landfill and that accounted for about 100,000. But because we converted a single use item into a reusable item, we ended up saving more than a million dollars a year on reprocessing. So practices that are mindful that decrease waste think about the environment are also actually very economically beneficial, right? There are a lot of other ongoing initiatives right now in which we're really surveying all the healthcare workers, surgeons, anesthesiologists, because often what we hear is this is how we've done things. And we're trying to identify motivators that will help people change their behavior, whether they're intrinsic or extrinsic motivators. We're working on recycling a lot of other things, but also we're looking at not using single use things. And one example I wanted to give here is foam. And we know how bad foam is for the environment. And we're trying to use reusable gels, which are available, freely available, and need some cleaning afterwards. So there's a lot of efforts ongoing right now within the department and the operating room and at UCSF. Uh, what do we do? What else can we do? We can incorporate cost awareness, an environmental responsibility in our education curriculum. And that hasn't happened so far as demonstrated by a survey of the anesthesia residents that I did. And CA1, CA2, and CA3 are residents different years of training. And it was sad to see that only 10% of the respondents described themselves as environmental and cost conscious while time in the anesthetic. And we presented this data to our program directors. And now every year we have sustainability training incorporated in our education. And what else can we do? And we can really sort of be a part, as I said, on the table for advocacy and policy making. And I wanted to present this slide, which just compared how just within North America, within sort of 20, 50 miles of each other, our practices are so different. So we have to talk about getting together as a group and coming up with guidelines, which are evidence-based and data-driven. Uh, a few examples I wanted to present here is the changes between Stanford and here. And I have really good colleagues. We work very closely with Stanford on um, green OR initiatives. And a simple to like pulse oximeter, Stanford uses reusable ones, while well as we use disposable ones. 
And for laryngoscopes, Stanford have gone between disposable to reusable ones. And sadly, we're going from reusable to disposable ones. The hover mats that I talked about, they only use it for a selected group of patients, while as we use it for all our patients. And the anesthesia gas advisory, which we have created, we are helping Stanford implement it to help them decrease their greenhouse emissions as well. Um, lastly, I wanna leave everyone listening to this with some tools that they can take to implement change. And one of the biggest tools is starting these conversations. Starting these confirmations and informing ourselves about the potential of the effects and all our impacts have, right? Together, all our choices are cumulative and consequential. So we inform ourselves about the impacts of our choices, right? Look at energy saving appliances, unplug our appliances at the end of the night, right? Make food choices, even if there's one meal that you can go from, you know, a meat-based meal to a vegetarian diet. Travel choices, huge impact on flying, right? Now, as we said, Zoom and webinars have become sort of vernacular, but incorporating that into our conferences and meetings. Talking about climate change on different meetings and agendas, and I've chaired a perioperative sustainability committee because climate change wasn't in our vernacular or those discussions did not happen at an operating room level, right? As patients, discussing with your providers and asking them what they are doing in their practice, what they are doing with their supply chain and their vendors to demand for safer, greener practices, and always trying to go towards reusable devices and whether that is at home or at work. Uh, I just want to end by saying that, um, you know, a famous quote from Gandhi, and I like to say he's another sort of famous Gandhi. And, um, if we really need to leave this planet and think about our civilization, then the time to act on climate change is now. And healthcare affects the very health of the patients that we're supposed to take care of. So thank you very much. And I wanted to leave you with a photo of me when I was going to chemotherapy. And I always look at this as the silver lining, be able to be here and spread the message along. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here and share my experience um, as the sustainability director for UCSF campus and UCSF health. Um, I see the entire university really dedicated to healthcare. So most of, and all, all of my discussion will kind of touch on both the campus and the health side. Um, just to give you a, a perspective on um, the impact um, that the UCSF campus has and then the thing that we are doing to to really address climate change and make a difference. So this screen is taken from Practice Green Health, which is a, 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 the only significant sustainability um, a nonprofit focused on healthcare. And they have looked at this as a three-pronged approach, which is very much in line with how UCSF is looking at what we can do um, to provide a healthy, healthy people, healthy planet, and to focus around sustainability, and specifically climate change. So the three prongs, um, lead broader societal transformation, create community and healthy resilience. And then the bulk of my talk will be focused on mitigating healthcare's impact. Um, so really regarding leading broader societal transformation, UC and UCSF are members of We Are Still In, which is the Paris Climate Agreement of 4,000 organizations across the country that are still aligned with the Paris Agreement, even though the federal government um, had withdrawn. But in addition to that, uh, we are members of Practice Green Health organization of 1,000 hospital systems throughout the U U US and um, climate leadership commitments from Second Nature, which is actually 600 universities um, across the country that have signed on committed to um, addressing sustainability and climate change. And you see of the 10 campuses, there's five health systems and three um, national laboratories. All of them are dedicated and supporting um, leading broader societal transformation through our influence, through our education, through our research and um, through working with all these organizations. And then lastly, the Healthcare Climate Council, which is a group of 18 of the largest health systems in the country. And we meet with them um, 
monthly to share best practices and um, try to really harness the power of the 10 health, the 18 systems to really enact change. And then the second one is creating community and healthy resilience. So we are working, um, we have created the Anchor Institution Initiative where our mission not only is to advance health worldwide, but that we start at home. And so we created this Anchor Institution to focus on workforce development, uh, what we can do to improve the impact of procurement within our community and also doing some community investment. So we did a report called the Advancing Health Equity in San Francisco looking at what the Anchor Institution can do. And we're also looking at ways that uh, climate change um, and what we do at the university can improve um, our community more broadly with regard to climate change. And then the third one is to mitigate healthcare's impact. And this is really where um, I'm gonna pick up where Seema left off and really talk more about the healthcare's impact of um, climate change, carbon emissions, 18% of the US economy is from healthcare and 10% of the whole US carbon emissions are from healthcare. 7% um, of all commercial industrial water use is in healthcare and we generate 5.9 million tons of solid waste a year. All these areas have an impact on climate. Um, and UCSF's own impact is significant. Um, we track our emissions year on year. And in 2019, we emitted 129,000 metric tons of CO2. Um, 80,000 of that was from natural gas. We generated 3,000 tons of landfill waste. So what can we do to um, mitigate that impact? And um, are we going through um, our strategy from there? So what UCSF is doing now really is we're partnering with the UC, um, UCSF and all of the four other health systems within the UC system um, and all of the campuses um, are, are seeing that the work that we're doing is a model for healthcare more broadly. And you see Janet Napolitano, when she signed on to the carbon neutrality goal by 2025, we all thought that that was really, we didn't know how to get there. <laughs> we thought it was a man on the moon Kind of idea and, and and that was really what she was thinking was you know we put a goal out there and we strive to read it and not only that but if we can't do it who can and and that put us in the mindset that we have to serve as an example to others beyond us and um and from that grew a lot of the sustainable practices policy um, started out with all these green buildings initially, then we focused on clean energy, climate protection, transportation, sustainable buildings and sustainable laboratories, zero waste, sustainable procurement, sustainable food, um, sustainable water systems, and specifically policies around our health systems. And as it turns out, all these policies touch on climate in one way or another. So let's start with green buildings. We have goals to outperform the California Building Code by 30% or more, which is pretty remarkable. Um, if you've heard of LEED certification, every new building we build has to be LEED gold. So it's bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. We have to just strive for that gold level. And then a new um, policy that came out just last year said that we cannot use natural gas for space and water heating in any of our new buildings. Um, and also laboratories, which we know are energy, very high energy um, density um, um, operations. We can only, you know, we have to strive to meet these other lead silver and a labs 21 um, standard. So what we've done is we focus on things on the right, uh, improving our um, um, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning controls in, in labs, in our operating rooms, procedure rooms, in the rooms that we can do uh, where we can, um, reduce energy by only providing uh, that ventilation when it's needed, when there's people, ac people actually occupied in those spaces. Capturing reject water um, from uh, dialysis treatment where there's reverse osmosis that generates a lot of water waste and recapture that. Um, a use of new technologies and trying to build all or mostly um, 
uh, mostly electric buildings. And the, the image below is a new housing building that we recently built that's all electric. Um, this is really the, the goals from the, um, our, actually the UC Sustainable Annual Report just came out and this is the number of green buildings certified on campus and those certified on the health side. So we're really working towards this um, and striving for as, as high as we can get on those. Um, clean energy is another one, the carbon neutrality goal by 2025 means that we have to shift to as clean as energy as we can get. Uh, but not only that, we have to reduce our energy usage per square foot by 2% a year. So not, it's not enough just to shift to electricity, but we have to actually reduce our usage of electricity. Um, another policy is to install on-site photovoltaics wherever it's cost effective and strive to buy more off-campus clean electricity, renewable power and clean power. Um, and then one of the other things that recently came on was uh, on-site combustion of natural gas will have to come from biogas. It can no longer come from um, traditional supplies. So what we've done is we've started to switch from natural gas to all electric for space and water heating and new construction and renovations. We've installed PV uh, where possible and we're buying um, energy, electricity from multiple sources, clean power SF, um, the Office of the President has a clean power program, the Western Area um, Power Authority, and then the SFPUC. So all these sources are getting cleaner and cleaner. And so that's what's making it, um, the biggest difference for us. So we have currently 3.3 megawatts of solar PV. It's enough to power 3,300 homes. Um, these are all the buildings that we have the PV on. And now we're starting to look at solar thermal where we can um, actually heat hot water through the sun and not have to burn electricity or natural gas to heat that water. And we have three buildings there that we're starting to build. Um, and so really we, we use 125,000 megawatts. So the 3.3 is just a portion of that, but it's, it's enough to, to make a dent and it shows that we have a commitment to that. Uh, the next one is climate protection. So this policy talks about the carbon, the carbon neutrality goal and we talk about different scopes. So I'll be talking about that in the next slide. But um, by 2025, we need to be carbon neutral. And then by um, 2050 is when we need to be carbon neutral with our scope three emissions. Um, we should be sharing a bit more about that. And then currently we have a, a goal for 2020 is to get back to our 1990 levels by 2020. And in, just to point out that we were one third the square footage that we are now um, in 1990. So our strategies there are just to reduce natural gas use in autoclaves and sterilizers, um, providing telework, alternative transportation, alternative fuel vehicles, really focusing on reducing business, business travel emissions by revisiting that need to travel. And we have a student group working on that right now. Uh, rethinking new construction. We have to re really think about, is there ways that we could build a building without using natural gas? And also to move away from high global warming potential refrigerants and medical gases. So all of these are part of our strategy. And this is a, a breakdown of our carbon emissions. So you can see scope one is really natural gas and some anesthesia gases in, um, down below here. Then you can see that um, diesel generators, fleet and refrigerants is all part of our scope one, but it's a very small piece of the pie. Then you can see electricity. Because our electricity is cleaning up so much, this is just identifying the carbon emissions from electricity and it's mainly PG&E. Um, all of our other electricity supplies are so clean, it doesn't even show up on this because it's, there's no emissions related to it. And then scope three is another area that we need to focus on. It's getting becoming a bigger and bigger piece of the pie, which is our commute. Uh, we have to account for all of our employees and our students and their commute. And all these emissions are basically from uh, single occupancy vehicles or carpools. And then business travel is another one. Um, air, air travel and rental car is all included in this. So this all told includes 43 campus buildings and 21 health buildings. And this is really our carbon emissions over time. And you can see we started tracking uh, even before 2009,
but you can see that it, it goes up and down and up and down. And this peak in 2015, 2016 is when we built a million square feet of hospital at Mission Bay. So every time you see a bump up, it's because we've built new buildings. But since then, we've taken a very aggressive approach at reducing our um, natural gas usage, being as efficient as possible, and decreasing our energy, our electricity usage. And we still have a long way to go. Um, the 2020 goal, you could see um, we've got some work to do. And then the 2025 goal to carbon neutrality to zero will be the biggest challenge. Um, our energy usage of intensity, if you can look on the upper one is the campus where you can see our target is blue and we are well below that. But for the health system, our target is blue and we are well above that. And we attribute that to a few things. Um, a lot of it has to do with the 24 seven operation. We know that's gonna be a challenge. We recently hired an energy manager who is focusing on all the areas that we can uh, possibly find to um, reduce our energy usage. So we do see a downward trend and we expect uh, with all the her projects coming on board that we should uh, hopefully meet our target. And then other energy efficiency projects. Um, I've been working on an MRI energy study. We look at medical imaging. It's 4% of total hospital emissions in most cases, uh, equivalent to about 26 homes. And we're working with US EPA to develop some possible energy star ratings for MRIs. We're also looking at ultra low temperature freezers. We have a lot of old freezers, about 1200 freezers across the entire campus. If we bought energy star, it would use 25% of that energy and we would cut our um, energy usage significantly and save money in electricity to the tune of about $2 million a year. Um, we also did some uh, uh, programs called Adopt the Spot. Where we actually help try to change behavior about uses of equipment and other projects like building automation control so that we can have automated lights turned off with sensors, um, continuously commissioning our buildings, kind of kind of tightening the screws and, and going back and checking the way the buildings are operating to make sure that they're built working as they are designed. Uh, when we have capital renewal projects where you know equipment is, is getting old and needs to be replaced, we'll replace them with more energy efficient carbon neutral pro, um, options and move away from high global warming uh, potential refrigerants. And then for transportation, we know transportation is is a big issue. You saw the pie chart with our commute, but also our fleet. So we're focusing on commute, we're also focusing on fleet. We're looking at employees and students. SOV, the single occupancy vehicle rate, is something we went, we've been trying to drive down year on year. And we are actually by far at the lowest in the whole UC system, but it's we still need to work on that. And then also buying zero um, emissions or hybrid fleet vehicles. Uh, you can see below here, we bought um, 15 electric buses that we are charging up every day as we take them out on the road. And then one of the goals is um, really to reduce our commute vehicles so that we have 4.5% of them that are zero electric vehicles. So you can see that we've been switching um, our fleet to alternative fuels. We're encouraging people to get out of their cars, telework, try alternative transportation, um, alternative fuel vehicles. We have 73 electric vehicle charging stations installed across the campus. And as I mentioned before, we're working on reducing business travel uh, through um, really focus groups and understanding why people need to travel and, and maybe why they don't need to. Sustainable buildings and lab operations. This is really existing buildings. How can we green our existing buildings, but also to look at labs. Labs use a lot of energy, a lot of equipment, a lot of heating, um, and cooling. So we've asked for labs um, to really come up with a, an action plan on what, what we can do to focus just on labs. And we've actually come up with a certificate program where 29 labs have been certified. Uh, we're encouraging all, them all to buy Energy Star appliances and equipment where they can. We're providing a rebate program to help um, incentivize that. Even um, changing the set point on those freezers can save a lot of energy. And we've, we've actually banned styrofoam coolers. And the next thing is zero waste. So we had talked about whether, um, you know, the, the amount of waste that's coming from a hospital and the amount of waste from, a, from research labs is something significant, but we have reduced our waste uh, quite a bit. And um, 
we're shooting for 90% waste diversion, which means all of our solid waste, out of all of our solid waste that we generate, only 10% goes to landfill. The rest is diverted to, re to recycling, reuse, compost. Um, um, so that's been the challenge. Um, we have a plastic ban in food service. Uh, we are requiring reusable and compostable foodware by July 2021, and actually no plastic bottles. So we're trying to switch to durables from disposables and uh, rechargeable batteries instead of disposable batteries. But if you think about the whole zero waste policy, there's a big compost um, um, section of it that really by pulling out organics from landfill, we actually eliminate methane gas production in landfill, which then leaks out into the atmosphere and contributes to climate change as well. So by pulling out all the compost and putting it back into um, uh, as fertilizer once it's treated, and that actually contributes to putting carbon back into the soil. So that's definitely um, part of the strategy. And you can see here that this is on the campus side. Uh, the goal was to get to, um, um, let's see, the 2020 goal. By 2020, we've actually are well below our 2020 goal and we're well below our 2025 goal. So we have yet to reach the 2030 goal, but we are on track at the campus side. On the health system side, it's a little bit different. Um, you know, we're talking about diverting all of our waste. Uh, we're not quite there yet, but we do have a 90% goal on the campus side. But if you look at the health side, um, it's been um, a little uneven. And I think, you know, more recently, um, this past year, because of COVID, we know that there's been a lot of disposable use and it's gonna be a challenge here to get to this 50% um, waste diversion goal. And then procurement is another one where it can have an impact on climate change. Um, Energy Star appliances and equipment were available. So we, we need just to really incentivize people to buy it. It's very challenging. Uh, not all the equipment is well labeled and well marked or well marketed. So that's one of the things we're focusing on uh, is refrigerators, freezers, and then really trying to encourage the medical equipment market to create more energy efficient products. Um, but that definitely, um, the procurement side is really where we can make a big impact on reducing the demand on electricity and switching from natural gas use to electric. Um, these are some of the other areas that we're focusing on in our procurement is tree-free paper. Uh, we have, we have a, a contract focusing on red list compliant uh, furnishings, which are, uh, have chemicals that are known to um, have health impacts. Um, so we have We've uh, decided we're gonna try to eliminate those in our furniture so we don't expose our patients or visitors or staff to off-gassing furnishings. And then also um, helping incentivize our staff to buy electric vehicles and we have discounts that we share with them. Um, this is another issue we talked about, um, ultra low temperature freezers. One ultra low temperature freezer uses as much energy as three households, three and a half households. And if we could reduce that energy use with a rebate program to buy energy, um, energy star, we expected that we could save $135,000 a year just on energy costs alone. And the health system side has also embraced this rebate program and we'll be implementing it as well. And then sustainable food, um, this one, we have goals to um, purchase 30% of all of our food as sustainable by 2030. That means purchasing local organic free range pesticide free food. And then um, on the campus side, 25% by 2030. And, and really this is another area that can impact climate change because if we're buying food, say we're buying raspberries from Chile, it has to be transported all the way across you know, the hemisphere uh, to get to us. And if we buy local, uh, the carbon emissions from um, the transport of that food would be significantly less. And if it's pesticide free, um, it also uses less um, um, emissions from the carbon just from the, the processes of uh, pesticide treatment. And so this is a UCSF campus, um, total spend on the campus side and total spend on the health side. And you can see it's significantly higher on the health side because our cafeterias at all three hospitals have a huge volume and um, they spend a lot of money on food 
And so the percentage of that food needs to come down um, to, to really to 30% to meet the sustainable food goal. And then sustainable water as well. Um, our goal is 36% reduction of water use, total water use from baseline um, from 2025. And we do this by actually looking, re-looking at where we have water flowing through equipment um, at what we call single pass. It just, the water flows through the equipment and goes right to the drain. So we're trying to change out all that equipment so that we don't have once through cooling happening at all. Um, we try to reuse water where we can, where it's acceptable, and then in, install low flow fixtures everywhere we can and water efficient equipment everywhere we can. But this also has a climate change impact in that it takes energy to run pumps to move water throughout our buildings, especially if we have to move them from a lower level to a higher level. Um, there is uh, energy required to move water through buildings. So the less water we use, the less energy we have to move it. And this is the campus side, uh, water conservation goals. We are well below the goal. We've saved thousands of gallons uh, per capita in, in water, water reduction. And on the uh, health side, we're almost at the 2020 goal. We're a little bit over, um, but we uh, now have a, a team of people on the health system side that are working on all these areas to uh, make improvements. And they just pulled together a team last, last year. Well, this is another area I mentioned, I mentioned before, um, water and eliminating once through cooling. So this is the more uh, refrigeration system and water would just flow through here 24 seven, not only when the compressors are running to keep it cold, but constantly. So we actually turn, put a valve in it and, uh, oh, sorry, we put a valve in it to just run it when the compressors are running. Um, Autoclave is the same thing. Uh, water was running through that, um, 24 seven, and then we just removed them because we weren't even using these autoclaves in the ORs. And then the health system, these are new policies that we just recently created. Um, part of it, one of them, the goals is practice green health. Um, it offers awards every year for performance and we are shooting for the highest award possible. Uh, we have to outperform ASHRAE standards for hospitals by 30% or more. That's a building code standards for hospitals. We're trying to uh, reduce our waste diversion um, and um, reduce the amount of waste that a patient generates per day. And we do this by looking at all the different options for carbon emissions reduction, uh, water waste, and building new hospitals to an, ex an ex a higher standard than the state requires. Uh, we, are, we are building a new surgery center clinic that we plan to exceed those standards as well. And we have a, an aggressive waste training and audit system happening that are starting up right now in the hospital to try to help us uh, meet those waste goals. And this is something new, it uh, came out as a policy, it's proposed, it maybe it's being, being reviewed right now is a carbon offset policy. So we know that, and all 10 campuses have recognized this, that the carbon neutrality goal by 2025 is very aggressive. Um, we may not meet it. And we know that in some cases, um, in a, like what we have at um, Parnassus campus, we have a central plant, it's a power plant that generates, um, um, uses natural gas to boil, to boil water and create steam. And that steam is used to turn a turbine that creates electricity. So that electricity actually feeds the entire campus and um, to convert from that to another technology we won't be able to do in by 2025. So we know that there are gonna be some indirect emissions that we will have to offset. So we came up with a policy to come up with the best offsets that we can with a, as a transition strategy to our goal. Um, we have high quality offsets credits that we are gonna be vetted by our academics. And then these priority projects will also coincide with supporting education, health, social justice, equity and that are as local as possible. And we hope that um, this and all of our policies uh, will serve an example for higher ed and industry and healthcare to, um, to give really um, targeted um, goals that are achievable to make a difference across, across the board. And we do everything we can to share best practices with other institutions. And then with regard to toxics reduction, we have a work group that 
I was focusing on this and it has to do with uh, reproductive health and the environment and pediatrics, um, a, a furniture contract. And we also partner with the Green Science Policy Institute in UC Berkeley to focus on these areas, fluorinated compounds, antimicrobials, flame retardants, uh, bisphenol A and phthalates that are um, endocrine disruptors, some solvents and some metals. And this is something that we chose um, outside of the UC policy that uh, resonates um, strongly with our population. And lastly, we have a culture shift work group that's also not UC, pol not UC policy, but UCSF has decided we need to educate our, our population. And so we have new campaigns coming out. We had a carbon neutrality campaign. It talked about what we can do to slow global warming and our climate changes health campaign. It talks about how climate has an impact on human health. Um, and this is all designed to educate our internal audience. And this is our 10 year of sustainability accomplishments. And one of the things I wanna point out is that we are actually um, emitting less greenhouse gases, 24% less greenhouse gases, even though we doubled our square footage um, by 2019. And then we have more new buildings coming online all the time, um, but we expect that we will continue to drive down our emissions um, as, as we proceed into the future. So that's one area uh, to point out. And then another one is leaner energy use. 20, we have a 12% reduction in campus-wide energy use with all our efficiency projects, even though we've doubled our square footage um, since 1990. So the takeaways really are that we, we have a strong policy. We continually update it annually. Um, and we will be continuing to take aggressive action to meet that 2025 carbon neutrality goal. Um, we've done work beyond UC compliance with our toxics reduction and culture shift work groups and really are looking at carbon offsets as the last resort. But we, we do see that our biggest challenge is the demand for more space, the growth of the campus and the fact that we have a central plant that's um, using natural gas but we are looking at all the different new technologies out there that can help us with that. And even if we um, can't do um, anything now, we want to plan a transition so that we can move into the future with a plan to uh, eliminate natural gas as much as possible. So if you have any questions, um, my email address and our website, you're welcome to reach out. Um, with questions and I, I think we'll probably have uh, more questions tonight. Well, thank you so much to both Seema Gandhi and Gail Lee for enlightening us about both the impact of healthcare on climate and what's happening specifically at UCSF. Um, we now aim to enrich our discussion by taking an international perspective and then diving into a conversation with all of our speakers. To assist us with this, I'd like to introduce our moderator today, Sarah Shear, who's a fourth year medical student at UCSF and a graduate of the UCSF Berkeley Joint Medical Program. Prior to medical school, Sarah studied anthropology at Amherst College, lived in North India for two years, and worked with a psychiatrist in rural Alabama running supportive programs for youth and older adults. Her love for the communities in India, Alabama, and California, and particularly for the children on the front lines of climate change, has motivated her to work in climate health advocacy. As such, Sarah is a co-founder of Climate Health Now, a network of health professionals organizing for climate action in California, and she's a founding advocacy co-chair of the organization Medical Students for a Sustainable Future, where she supports medical student climate activism. She also serves as co-chair of the American Academy of Pediatrics, California chapter task force on climate change and health. And if that isn't enough, she's been awarded a 2021 University of California Carbon Neutrality Initiative Fellowship. It's been my privilege to collaborate with Sarah on a variety of climate health projects at UCSF and I can easily say that working with such amazing young people as Sarah keeps me inspired and hopeful for the future. Sarah is now applying for pediatric residency programs, and although she feels the tug of family on the East Coast, we hope that she will stay here at UC San Francisco. 
Um, Sarah will now introduce our guest panelist, Josh Carliner, and we invite uh, Josh to come on. And she will be moderating, moderating our um, panel conversation as well. Thanks, Sarah, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Catherine, for that warm introduction. Um, and I'm so grateful for your mentorship. Um, and now it's my privilege to introduce Josh Carliner, our panelist this evening. Um, who joins us to provide an international perspective on the topic of healthcare's impact on global warming. Um, and Healthcare Without Harm, which is the organization where he serves as the International Director of Program and Strategy, has been really innovating solutions in this sector for over 20 years. Josh has led Healthcare Without Harm's global green and healthy hospital network, and among other activities, he has led a global effort to rid uh, medical devices of mercury. And his particular focus now is on the intersection of health and climate. And Josh has more than 30 years of experience working on international environmental and human rights issues. And so he really brings a deep perspective to some of our major complex problems affecting humanity in 2020. So we're very grateful that Josh Carliner has taken the time to be here tonight to teach us about the work at Healthcare Without Harm and to enrich this conversation um, with a better understanding of some of the international efforts to reduce the carbon footprint of healthcare. So welcome, Josh. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, it's a pleasure to be here um, and a pleasure to share the panel with uh, both Gail and Seema. Um, and Gail, just so impressive to see all the work it, it UCSF, I, I think I saw a presentation you did a few years ago, and um, to see how it's grown and evolved is just stunning. Um, it's really, really great. Um, so briefly about Healthcare Without Harm, we are an international NGO, an international nonprofit organization that has offices on three continents. So we have an office in the US, uh, one in Brussels for the European Union, um, one in Manila, Philippines uh, for Southeast Asia. We have a team of people working in Latin America, um, and then formal partner organizations that represent our interests in um, India, China, Nepal, South Africa, Brazil, Australia, um, and um, one other country I'm forgetting. We also coordinate, as um, Sarah was mentioning, a global network of hospitals and health systems committed to sus work on sustainability in 72 countries. Um, there are more than 1,500 institutional members representing about 44,000 hospitals and health centers. The U.S. branch of that is Practice Green Health, which is Healthcare Without Harm's implementation arm um, in the United States, which um, uh, UCSF and UC Health are a member of. Um, and then we also have a number of different initiatives that work with the World Health Organization, United Nations Development Program, World Bank and others, and then we sort of build out cohorts of um, leading health systems to address issues like climate change. So the Healthcare Climate Council that Gail mentioned is something that Healthcare Without Harm also convenes. Um, so I, what I wanna do for a second here is just kind of zoom out. So, I and mean, we heard about um, sort of the, the climate footprint of healthcare in the United States, and we heard about the efforts of um, one health system, uh, UCSF, which is part of a bigger uh, um, UC health system to address um, uh, the health impacts of climate change. But as you all know, from all the um, different courses that you've done so far, um, and just from watching the world, climate change is a global problem. Um, and healthcare is um, unfortunately part of that global problem. Uh, we produced a study last year, and there have been a few other academic studies that have kind of come out both before and after it um, that kind of co corroborate what we found, which is that healthcare's climate footprint is the equivalent of 4.4% of net global carbon emissions. So what does that mean? Um, that's the equivalent of the emissions every year from 514 coal-fired power plants, or if healthcare were a country it would be the fifth largest polluter, climate polluter on the planet. Um, so this, you know, when we put this report out, it came as a surprise to a lot of folks, both in the health sector and folks working on climate change. Um, uh, but it is, um, you know, very much uh, the reality. And I wanna share with you some couple slides just to show you how it breaks down a little bit as well. 
here's part of what we found. Um, if you know, if you look at this wheel on the right, um, the United States, China, and the European Union are responsible for half of all of healthcare's climate emissions. Um, and even though China is the world's top uh, climate emitter right now, um, the United States health sector far surpasses the Chinese health sector in terms of its emissions. So the US health se sector, and it's not really surprising, is the biggest pig in the shed here. Um, um, and that, you know, I think corresponds with some of what Seaman was telling us about, you know, where, you know, healthcare is, you know, almost 20% of US GDP. We spend way more on healthcare. We have much more expensive and intensive interventions for worse health outcomes. And one of the bad health outcomes from, of all those interventions is our contribution to climate change. Um, and just nine countries plus the European Union make up 75% of all of healthcare's climate footprint. Um, and on a per capita basis, if you look on the left side there, you'll see that um, the US is also one of the top emitters per person. So just a little bit of context um, in that regard. And then, um, I don't know why, oh, there we go, okay. Um, uh, Gail was talking a little bit about the greenhouse gas protocol scopes, which you may or may not be familiar with, but um, scope one is on-site emissions. And so that's where you see natural gas um, is the big uh, contributor. Scope two is um, purchased energy for hospitals and health systems. And then scope three is um, the global supply chain and transport and other things. And so um, one of the challenges that hospitals and health systems have all around the world is that um, they're not, they're, they're, there aren't good ways to actually um, calculate from a systems perspective your scope three emissions and then track them. But, um, and so right now, for instance, you see and most other hospitals and health systems in the world, except for a few like the National Health Service in England, which I'll get to in a minute, don't really understand their scope three emissions that well. Um, but as they do, they're gonna to have to start doing stuff about them. Um, and so if you look in the chart on the right, you can see what's included in that. So it's you know, all the food, all of the carbon footprint of the food that hospitals buy and the gowns that they buy um, from agriculture, if it's cotton, um, it's a little bit of transport, it's pharmaceuticals um, and chemical products, um, and it's electronics, um, and it's a lot of the energy that's used to produce all that stuff. Across all these scopes, and this is a key piece here, is that it's energy generation that is the primary driver of healthcare's climate footprint, which again, isn't a surprise because energy generation, the combustion of fossil fuels is the primary driver of the climate crisis. Um, but what it means is that in order for healthcare ultimately to decarbonize, to move to net zero emissions, um, Healthcare does not, not only must it clean up its own act and get those more efficient MRI machines and get rid of dust flooring and put on solar panels on its own facilities, but healthcare must also participate in the broader societal effort to decarbonize the economy. Um, and by doing so, it will reduce its own footprint and will also improve public health by reducing all of the impacts from fossil fuel combustion, including air pollution, which contributes to um, ambient air pollution contributes to more than 4 million deaths a year around the world. So um, uh, moving away from fossil fuels and toward clean renewable energy is the most important action that healthcare can take both on site in terms of what it purchases and in terms of the broader societal context in which it sits. Um, so last slide, and then I'll jump back from slides. You guys have been looking at too many slides tonight. Um, but um, I think here's the good news is that, um, and this is, this, is, this is part of the good news. One of the things Healthcare Without Harm does is that we run this healthcare climate challenge. And this is from a year ago where there were 200 participants representing 18,000 hospitals. We now have 300 participating institutions in 35 countries representing 22,000 hospitals and health centers that are participating in an effort to mitigate healthcare's their own footprint, to reduce their own footprint, to become more resilient, and to be, take leadership action to address climate change. And that's what the climate challenge is. And you can see some of the reporting coming from here. Um, and 
you know, and so I think, so UC Health, for instance, is a member of this climate challenge, um, as are many hospitals and health systems all around the world, including England's National Health Service, which this year made a commitment to net zero emissions. It is the first ever hospital and health system, uh, national hospital, I'm, I'm sorry, national health system in the world to make that commitment. It is also the largest national health system in the world. Um, and it is setting the gold standard. It is the leading edge of this work. It's you know committing to 100% zero emission vehicles. It's gonna build a hydrogen powered ambulance. It's going to um, build new hospitals that are completely zero emission buildings. Um, it's, it's moving forward um, on all fronts and sort of uh, paving, paving the way for the rest of us to go forward. And then here in this country, UC Health is a leader, as is Kaiser Permanente, as is Cleveland Clinic, and several others that are moving toward carbon neutrality. Um, so um, it, I, it, in some ways, it's really interesting. All this is happening in the midst of this pandemic, and yet um, some of these leading health systems are saying, OK, we're completely slammed by COVID-19. Um, and the next crisis is around the corner. We've got to prepare for that crisis. In fact, it's here in many places and it's hitting us hard um, uh, and that's climate change. And so we've got to become more resilient and we have to do our part to align healthcare with the ambition of the Paris Agreement and move towards zero emissions. And we're starting to see that happen all over, all over the world. So that's super exciting. That's a very short version of the, you know, a lot going on. Um, but um, we are, I, I would just say that, you know, it's really great to see um, UCSF in the lead on this work. Um, there's a lot more to do. Um, and I'll, I'll just say one last thing, which is that um, the climate challenge that I just shared with you um, has been um, uh, named as the partner of the UNFCCC, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change's Race to Zero which means that what we'll be doing over the next few years, um, starting in the spring, is to build a cohort of hospitals and health systems committed to net zero emissions from around the world. And they will be recognized by the United Nations as this health, you, uh, race to zero for health. And so um, I wanna take Wonderful. this opportunity to invite Gail and UCSF and UC Health to join the race to zero and become part of our first cohort this spring. And Gail, um, we, we can uh, take it offline, but I, I think just looking at your slides that you guys probably fit the bill. And that's a great um, moment to invite Gail and, and Seema to join us again. And uh, so excited for this uh, conversation that we get to have now. Um, and I, I just wanted to, to start, um, you know, we've got some questions rolling in and, um, a theme that's coming up is around the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and during this time, we've really seen the urgency of helping our health systems be more resilient in crisis and also responsive to how racial injustice drives health inequities. And so I have kind of a two-part question here. And the first is, how do you see healthcare sustainability as connected to resilience of health systems in crisis? Um, and also to racial justice. And my second question there is how do you see, you know, what do you see as the future directions for healthcare sustainability advocacy in the context of the pandemic recovery? You know, I, I think, you know, we see, um, you know, that there's a, there, there are a number of different, different points around this, I think. I mean, there, there's so many different connections between COVID and climate and inequity. So, you know, if you look at climate change, who are the, you know, everybody's affected by climate change, but the, the, the poor and the marginalized, and in this country, it's uh, primarily people of color are the hardest hit, um, communities of color. Um, who are the most, everybody's affected by COVID, but who are the hardest hit? Um, it's the same groups of people. And some of them are experiencing one on top of the other, um, whether it's because they're experiencing extreme weather events or because they live in air pollution impacted communities um, that make them more vulnerable to COVID-19 um, because of their compromised uh, respiratory systems. Um, so, uh, you know, there, there's, in terms of the, um, the structural racism that exists both in our society and globally, 
um, you know, that plays out in terms of, uh, you know, uh, climate politics and COVID politics. Um, and those two are, are super intimately interrelated. The flip side of it is that a lot of the um, solutions um, can, can be shared solutions. And so when we talk about um, um, transforming healthcare, we can't just talk about transforming it to become climate smart, to, be, to mitigate and to be resilient, but we need to, to think about how we transform healthcare in the 21st century so that it actually protects people's health and, and serves all communities. And um, you know, the example Gail gave of the resilience work in San Francisco where um, um, UCSF is investing in the community and leveraging its resources in that way is, is I think the way to go. Um, a, a one way that you know, we're seeing is, is you know, a way that health systems can actually foster greater community resilience and sustainability at the same time, um, help create jobs, um, in um, uh, environmentally sustainable areas that um, both serve the interests of the health system and the community. So I'll stop there. I'm sure both Gail and Seema have more to say and there's, there's so much more to talk about in that subject. So it's, it's interesting. Um, one of the things that we recognized was when COVID first uh, struck was the shortage of PPE and it was we did an appeal to the community to donate um, masks, um, N95s and, and surgical masks. Um, and and as, as it turned out, um, we actually decided to donate a lot of that uh, excess masks. And, and it was mainly because we train our staff on a certain brand and a certain size that they're fit tested for. And uh, so all of those that brand we set aside and those went to all of our staff because they're all trained, we know how to use it. But we got a lot of donations from all different other countries and different brands and, and different different sizes. So um, we got a call you know, um, from someone who was concerned at Hunter's Point that they didn't have the resources to provide those masks for their community. And one, I made one call to the hospital and within a day, we sent many trucks <laughs> to deliver a lot of these masks um, and PPE to them. But then it also brought up uh, the, the comment about resilience and um, climate resilience and how we can help our dis the disadvantages communities in our area um, weather that storm. And so we've actually been talking about, um, you know, when we talk about carbon offsets, can we identify a carbon offset that can help a disadvantaged community in some way. And we were thinking about ideas about maybe potentially um, getting funding that could provide a transition from natural gas to electricity and, and then create that as a carbon offset of some kind and then be able to get credit for that, provide a community benefit and reduce carbon all at the same time. So we're throwing around ideas like that, just you know, to see if it's a possibility. And we have a, a task force that's working on um, looking at the carbon offsets that we could purchase or some carbon offsets that we could actually create to benefit more than just you know, for the purposes of the offset, but to really have some community benefit. And Sarah, I would like to sort of take a different take and, and offer some of the practical examples that we've seen. And not just with COVID, but some of the other climate events, you know, the hurricanes that happened. And I think it has really exposed a lot of vulnerabilities in supply chain, right? Every day we would get emails about, oh, so-and-so drug was procured from Puerto Rico. And now that they've hit by a hurricane, you know, we don't have those drugs. And so I think that these conversations are happening and we're trying to identify that climate change and the events related to climate change are actually exposing our vulnerabilities in supply chain. Now, I, I do sort of say this, and I, I alluded during my talk, is the silver linings to COVID, right? And I think that, um, you know, there's a big task force now on looking at how to reuse some of the supplies, right? And there's a lot of research happening on how to sort of sterilize PPEs and reuse them. And I almost feel like it's 
it's brought this focus back on reusable items and really thinking out of the box. But um, what I always like to say is also that because, you know, the economy and institutions have taken such a big economic hit with COVID and the shutdown, that now more than ever before, there is also a focus to look at how do we prevent waste? And it might be for purely sort of economic benefits, but we all know that for most part, decreasing waste has both an economic and an economic impact and an ecological impact. So I think that COVID has sort of brought this to the forefront as well. Is it like, why are we decreasing waste? Why are we decreasing waste? And we definitely in the operating room in the last six months have undertaken projects that would probably have taken me a few years to get going. And now with sort of, this is the dollar impact, this is the carbon footprint, this is the downstream impact, COVID has helped um, some of those projects to move along as well. Thank you so much. Um, and I think that dovetails nicely into um, another question um, that's more about how do we um, make sure that all healthcare systems and universities follow in, in UCSF's footsteps. And, and I'm wondering about, you know, based on your experiences, um, what tactics do you advise um, people who want to advocate within their health system or to their health system to become more sustainable? What tactics have you seen be particularly effective and maybe in, in institutions that are also quite motivated by profit um, or have other, other motives um, in addition to providing health care and um, overcoming this idea that this is how we've always done it that Dr. Gandhi was talking about earlier? I can take a step at this one first. Um, and I'll speak from the medical center perspective. And this is a question that whether, whether I was at Mayo or UCLA, like this is a question that comes up is how do we engage the stakeholders and how do we engage our leadership to invest in some of these ideas and you know support them? And um, I, I would say it takes one person and a good conversation, right? And, and persistence, you know, like with everything else, persistence. But also, I also sort of knowing that often, I come back to this again, is often making a, a sort of economic and a dollar case and an ecological case. And I usually have two pitches together for most talk and Gail know this, if I am talking to sort of the CFOs and you know the C-suite, then I will always say, oh, look, if we don't use this, then we're gonna save a hundred dollars. And then if I'm talking to sort of a group that's more environmental and um, climate change, then I have, I look at sort of the carbon footprint side of things. So I think that really knowing that both of these coexist is very, very important. And then creating an entire committee, I think initially it took me a while because, you know, we wanted to get the surgeons and staff and supply chain and, you know, just get an entire team together. I think that that really helps if you create a vision with the whole team. Um, that's usually been very helpful um, as well. And, and finding a partner, I think that, you know, in Gale, I found a partner that some of the changes have been really easy to make. Um, so I, yeah, that's some of my advice on how to get it going. So I'd like to say two things. Um, one is that when I, like I've been talking to Children's Hospital Oakland and uh, there's a, a very passionate nurse over there who wants to do everything. Um, and, and she was having trouble prioritizing. And I, and I said to her, you know, we're in a fiscal crisis now. Every hospital um, is challenged with budgets, budget cuts. And, and, and it has always been this way. I started at UCSF in the middle of a recession and budget cuts. And my, my first um, way to show value was to show cost savings. So I looked at all the different things that we could have done and picked reprocessing as the first thing to start with. And after eight years of of continually improving on reprocessing, we've saved over $12 million in that time. And so that builds credibility and that shows you're adding value to the bottom line and people appreciate that. And when they see that there's an opportunity and someone who's passionate about 
looking at that, um, it, it does help them do more projects in the future. The other thing is something that SEMA has been a champion for. It was this Caring Wisely um, grant, which raised the, the visibility of the project. And now that so many people have saw what she's been doing around saving resources in surgery and, and the OR and the carry-off area, that people are jumping on board, wanting to be a part of it. And it's really made a huge impact. And, and I think part of that is because they have top leadership supporting this Caring Wisely projects. Um, and, and they're using lean principles, which they want to, they're trying to promote throughout the entire organization. So it's an example of lean principles that, that has huge impact. And just increasing that visibility has really made the, that, that effort um, more interesting to people. People are engaged about it, they're excited about it. And, and when we can show true value and everyone sees it, it just has more cachet. Thank you. So um, I'll just say this. I mean, I think you know, what Seema and, and Gail said is key. Um, and anybody, you know, wherever you are, there's something you can do to um, help make the kind of change that, that we need to have happen. And at the same time, um, what's clear is if you look at the magnitude of the climate crisis, you look at healthcare's contribution to it, um, and you look at how far we've gotten so far with you know, the exemplary work of different hospitals like UCSF, it's not nearly enough. And so what we have to start thinking about is how we completely transform healthcare in the 21st century. Um, so that it is climate smart, so it is pandemic prepared, um, and so that it is much more equitable. It needs to be much more about prevention of disease, um, and it needs to. We need to rethink how healthcare is delivered as well, um, because it. Uh, we, we have to do our part, and you know, it, otherwise we're we're going to be in uh, worse calamity than we are uh, tomorrow. The Secretary General of the United Nations is going to give a major speech on climate change. Um, and he's gonna lay it out again, where he's already said it's an existential threat. Um, and he's gonna you know, talk about how serious the problem is. And it's, you know, you start reading the Secretary General of the UN talking about things in the way he's talking about it, where um, you know, he's basically saying coal has to go now. You know, um, it's the Secretary General of the UN. That's not like a Greenpeace activist. Um, so we have to think that way as well in, in the healthcare sector. We have to really think in a transformative way. My goodness, we've learned a lot tonight. I wish we could um, keep going for a while yet because it's such an important conversation. And of course, we have more questions coming in that we've also been trying to address behind the scenes here. But for now, um, we will need to call it a night. Uh, Seema Gandhi, Gail Lee, Josh Carliner, thank you guys so much, not only for participating tonight, but for all the work that you do, such important work um, in this critical time. And Sarah Shear, um, what a wonderful fourth year medical student. Thank you for all the work that you do and for moderating for us tonight.